Our next topic after compound interest is in chapter 10 on annuities. And we're going to be covering off basically the future value and present value, both of ordinary simple annuities, ordinary general annuities. And then in another set of notes, we'll do the simple and general annuity dues, and then also calculating period payments, periodic payments. I do have included some notes for these section seven and section eight, but technically, <clears throat> They're not covered in our curriculum. They're there just for your interest if you wanted to go through them. So for here, we have a couple of different online tutorials that you should be going through. The introduction to annuities, the future value and present value of the ordinary simple and ordinary general. And also there is an assignment that you should be working on this week after you finish these notes. Same as before, keep your order of operations, do your correct rounding, and only round at the very end of the problem. So I have a couple of different um, acronyms or short forms. OA for ordinary annuity, AD for annuity due, ordinary simple annuity, ordinary general annuity, simple annuity due, and general annuity due. So first off, we have to discuss what is an annuity. So an annuity is just a series of payments. Uh, usually they're in equal amounts, making it easier, and we make them at regular intervals of time. We make these payments for different things. Maybe we're leasing a car or leasing equipment. Maybe we're paying off a car or maybe paying for an equipment, piece of equipment. We could have mortgage payments, so maybe the same type of thing. We've gotten a mortgage from a financial institution and we have to pay off our mortgage to buy a house. We could also have it for maybe renting different things. So in business, you're going to see how we typically do a lot of things where we have a series of payments in order to pay off a particular piece of equipment or an item that we might want or need. So annuities at their base are just equal payments made at regular intervals. The two categories of annuities are ordinary annuities and annuity dues. And we have ordinary annuities. The payments are made at the end of each payment period. So for example, I'm leasing a car and I make my payments at the end of the month. If that's the case, it's an ordinary annuity. If I make the payments at the beginning of the month, then that's an annuity due. So just when the actual payment is made differentiates it. We then have under each main category, the simple and general cases for annuities. And the simple case is when the compounding period and the payment period are the same. So for example, I have a nominal rate of J2 is equal to say 4% and I'm making semi-annual payments. So the J2 and the semi-annual match, that's a simple case. In the case of an ordinary general annuity, the compounding period and the payment period are not the same. So for example, same thing, I have a J2 4%, but my payments are being made monthly. So monthly and semi-annual are not the same. So that's a general case, okay? And then the same thing applies for simple annuity dues and general annuity dues. Simple, the compounding period and payment periods are the same. General, compounding period and payment periods are not the same. So there's our annuities. We're gonna be going through today our ordinary annuities and we'll look at the simple and we'll look at the general cases. Now there's a number of formulas in our textbook that we can use. Um, hopefully you've been recognizing that our formulas have been getting a little bit more complicated as we progress in the course. So our future value of an annuity is equal to the payment, whatever that payment dollar amount is, times one plus the periodic interest rate raised to the number of compounding periods, subtract one, all divided by the periodic interest rate. We can see our accumulating factor is there again. We can see that we still have the positive exponent of n indicating we're going into the future. So we have a future value we're calculating. We have the present value formula, very similar structure. The payment again, the numerator is what changes. This time we have one minus one plus the periodic interest rate to the negative n all over the periodic interest rate. And again, notice we have the accumulating factor with a negative exponent indicating we're going into the past. So we're calculating a present value. Now we have some formulas here. 
for our equivalent interest rates. So let's just take a look at what we had seen before in compound interest. When we were equating our new periodic rate to our old periodic rate, we were able to rearrange it and get the new periodic rate is one plus I, our old periodic rate, all that raised to the power M old over M new, and then all of this then subtract one. We could simplify it by showing that I2 is equal to 1 plus I to the M1 over M2. Again, all of this subtract 1. And your textbook shows it in a slightly different form. Here's the I2 is the 1 plus I, so the same as before. But instead of showing the exponent M1 over M2, they show C. So number of compounding periods or number of over number of payments per year. So whichever one you use is fine, but you have to recognize that for annuities, especially the general case, we're going to have to calculate this unknown periodic rate. And it'll become clearer as we do some questions. Number of different symbols, same as before, we have our term T, we have our payment PMT, our number of payments, remember the number of payments is the number of compoundings per year times the time in years. Your compounding frequency, of course, is your M. That's the number of times interest is compounded every year. We have our nominal interest rate, J. Then we also have our periodic rate. And remember, the relationship between I and J is the periodic rate, is the nominal rate divided by the number of compounding periods. So let's take a look at our ordinary simple annuities. So remember, ordinary means the payments are being made at the end of each payment period. So if we have a timeline, here's our first payment period, and our first payment is at the end of that period. Simple means that the compounding period and the payment period are the same. So for example, if this was a monthly payment, we would have a J12, we'd have our periodic rate, our monthly periodic rate. So our compounding period and our payment period would be the same. For ordinary general annuities, again, ordinary means end. Here's our schedule again for our timeline. Our payment is again at the end. General means that the compounding period and the payment period are not the same. So for example, maybe we have a monthly um, <clears throat> payment period, but our compounding period might be quarterly, okay? So they don't match, okay? And that's something that's gonna require us to do an extra calculation. Let's take a look and try and identify the different types of annuities because for these types of questions, for this type of application, that's gonna be the first thing that we're gonna wanna figure out. So here we have deposits or payments of 5,000 are made at the end of each year for four years into an account earning 9% compounded annually. And we wanna know what's the account balance at the end of the fourth year. So if we take a look where our deposits are at the end of the year, so end meaning ordinary, year, so that's our payment period. And then we also have our nominal rate is annually so yearly and yearly match, ordinary simple annuity. What's the accumulated value after 25 years of end of month deposits of $300 into a fund earning 8% compounded monthly? And then how much interest is earned over this time? Once again, our deposits are being at the end of the month. So end being ordinary, monthly payments and monthly compounding ordinary simple annuity. Next one, deposits of 3,000 are made at the end of each six month period into a retirement fund for eight years. At that point, the deposits change to 600 per end of month for a further eight years. What are the accumulated values or what is the accumulated value of the deposits after 16 years if rates are 9% compounded semi-annually? and 10% compounded monthly for the first and second eight year periods. This is similar to our compound interest questions where we saw that the interest rate does change over time, which is very realistic. So the first thing we have to recognize is that for the first eight year period, we're putting away $3,000 at the end of each six month period. 
so end ordinary, six months, so that's semi-annually, and our first interest rate is also semi-annually, so ordinary simple annuity. For the other annuity that's going on for the second eight years or the last eight years, well now we have $600 end of month this time as opposed to the end of each six month. So this is monthly payments, end means ordinary, monthly payments and compounded monthly interest, we have another ordinary simple annuity. Determine the cash value of a contract with end of quarter payments of 6,500 over a four year period at 9% compounded quarterly. We see the end of quarter payments, so end means ordinary, ordinary quarterly payments and compounding quarterly, they match, so ordinary simple annuity. Let's do a couple more. <clears throat> What's the cash value of a lease contract for a vehicle that requires a down payment of 2000 end of month payments of 350 for three years, and a cash buyout of 15000 at the end of the third year, if the lease rate is 9% compounded monthly. Now there's a lot of different things going on in this particular question, but we're just going to focus in on the annuity for now. So we have end of month payments, end meaning ordinary, monthly payments, monthly compounding, meaning simple. So ordinary simple annuity. Determine the accumulated value of end of year deposits of 8,000 for 15 years into an account earning 11% compounded quarterly. Again, we have end and end of yearly payments or yearly deposits, so ordinary, but the payments are yearly and our compounding is quarterly, so we have an ordinary general annuity in this case. Determine the mortgage amount if end of month payments of 1100 are required for 20 years at 8.9% compounded semi-annually. Again, we have end, meaning ordinary. We have monthly payments and compounding semi-annually. So semi-annual and monthly don't match, so ordinary general annuity. And lastly, a company makes end of semi-annual deposits of 35,000 for 20 years into a fund earning 13,000 compounded quarterly. How much will have accumulated in the fund after the last deposit? Again, we have end, meaning it's an ordinary annuity, ordinary uh, end of payment, end of month or end of semi-annuals, excuse me, end of period deposits. Then we have semi-annual deposits and compounding quarterly. So this is every six months, this is quarterly, this is every three months, those don't munch, so ordinary general annuity. Now, in addition to being able to identify what type of annuity you have, it's also going to be important to determine, well, what actually am I calculating? Am I calculating a present value or am I calculating a future value? In the case of this first example, determine the cash value. Cash value means what would it be in cash today? So that would be the present value. Determine the accumulated value. Well, it's accumulating, it's growing, that's going to be the future value. Determine the mortgaged amount. Well, the mortgaged amount, if say if I'm buying a house and I'm getting a mortgage on it, I'm receiving money today so I can buy the house. So mortgaged amount is the present value. And the last one here, how much will have accumulated, again, that will be a future value. So a number of things that we have to keep track of now, what are we calculating, present value, future value, and what kind of annuity do we have, ordinary simple or ordinary general. Let's take a look at the future value of an ordinary simple and general annuity. So we have an example here where Abriella, she's decided to invest $1,000 at the end of every year for five years in a savings account. Who knows what she's saving for? Maybe she's saving for a vacation. Maybe she's saving for um, a big purchase. Lots of different things we could be saving for. The account earns interest rate of 10% compounded annually. And she wants to determine how much is she going to have at the end of five years. So here we can lay it out in a timeline. So here's our zero today. Here's our time in the future, five years. And each of these periods here is one year. 
So she'll make a payment at the end of the first year, at the end of the second, at the end of the third, the fourth, and then finally the fifth. And she wants to know how much she's going to have at the end of that five year period. So all these payments have to go into the future. Okay. So here <clears throat> for our first payment, well, her payment is $1,000. So that's the last payment here, 1000. So it's not going into the future at all. So our N is zero. So the $1,000 she's putting in grows to $1,000. And you should recognize the compound interest formula here. This second to last payment, well, it's only going to be growing for one year. And again, remember what kind of annuity do we have here? Well, we have end of year payments and we have compounding annually. So that's a simple annuity and it's end. So it's going to be ordinary. And we can do this same analogy here, <clears throat> moving each of the payments, future calculating the future value by the number of periods. So this is our one plus I to the N. And if we add all these up, we'll get to see that at the end of five years, Apriella will have $6,105.10. Now, this is sort of the slow way of calculating an annuity. And maybe for a five year period, it's not too difficult to do. But hopefully you can appreciate if this was like, say, 20 years, or if there was 12 payments per year, this would be very, very difficult to do. So we wouldn't warn, not so much difficult, but very boring and take a lot of time. So what we have is we have that this calculation here can be summarized with this formula. The future value will equal to the payment times the one plus the periodic rate to the n number of compounding periods, subtract one, all divided by the periodic rate. Let's try this example. Deposits of 5,000 are made at the end of each year for four years into an account earning 9% compounded annually. Determine the account balance at the end of the fourth year. So first of all, we have an ordinary simple annuity. End payments, they're done yearly. We're compounding yearly. So ordinary for end, simple for the two matches. What are we calculating? Well, we want to know the account balance at the end of the fourth year. So that's going to be our future value. Let's set it up. And we can see here, here's today, zero. Here's our one year, our first payment at the end of the year, and it's $5,000. Here's our nominal rate, J1 is 9%. Remember J1 is also another different way of saying the effective interest rate or F, and there's our four years. And note that our last payment is at, made at the end of four years. Now we're taking all these payments and we're bringing them into the future. So very similar to the compound interest, but now we have a series of payments. We're going to do the exact same steps where we need the periodic rate and we need the number of compounding periods. So the periodic rate, since they do match, it's a simple case. All we need to do to get the I is the J over M. So it's 0.09 per year. So don't forget to put the per when you're doing these. The number of compounding periods, we have four years. There's one payment being made per year. So we have four yearly payments. And we can see here, just like we saw for compound interest for the money movement line, that's again what this line is here. These units need to match. So per year and yearly must match. Plugging into our formula, 5,000, 1 plus the 0 0.09, all of that raised to the fourth, then all of that subtract one, then all of that divide by 0 0.09, multiply by 5,000, and you'll get 22,865. Let's try another one. <clears throat> What's the accumulated value after 25 years of end of month deposits of 300 into a fund earning 8% compounded monthly? How much interest is earned over this time? Identifying the type of annuity again, we have end, so ordinary, monthly deposits, and compounding monthly, simple. An annuity because we're making regular periodic payments. What do we want to calculate? Determine the accumulated value. So those are keywords indicating future value. Here's the timeline. 
there's today, there's our 25 years, here's our monthly payment schedule at the end of each month we're putting away three thousand three hundred dollars our nominal rate is j12 is eight percent and again please notice that the last payment is made at the end of the 25 years money movement line we're taking this series of payments and we're bringing it into the future we want to know how much will it be equal to Same as before, we need our periodic rate because it's simple. We can just take our nominal rate, divide by the number of compounding periods, 12, and we get double naught six six and keep all the decimals per month. The number of compounding periods, well, 25 years times 12 payments per year, we'll get 300 monthly payments. And again, always check the periodic rate is per month and our number of compounding periods is number of months. Plugging it into our formula, 300 times the one plus the double naught six six, keeping all the decimals, all of that raised to 300, subtract one, and then all divided by the double naught six six, again with all the decimals. We calculate that out and we get $285,307.92. Now we did want to know how much of this was interest that was earned over this 25 year period. So the relationship with annuities for future value and interest is the interest is going to equal to the future value of the annuity minus the total amount we actually put in. So that's the total amount paid. So that's the number of payments times the payment quantity. Plugging in the values, that's our 285307.92. We made 300 payments, okay, remember here, 300 monthly payments, each of them were $300. We performed this calculation and the amount of interest that the person has paid is $195.307.92. So you can see over the course of a very long time period, um, we do pay a lot of interest on payments. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the accumulated value of end of year deposits of 8,000 for 15 years into an account earning 11% compounded quarterly. So again, we're making regular payments or regular deposits at the end, so it's ordinary. They're yearly deposits, but the compounding is quarterly. So this time we have an ordinary general annuity. And when we have the general case, we have one little extra step to do. Setting up our timeline again. So there's our $8,000 payment made at the end of the first year. We're doing this for 15 years. Our last payment is at the end of the 15th year. Our money movement line, we're taking all these payments and we're figuring out what the future value is because we wanted the accumulated value. And now here we're going to have to have our periodic rate and our number of compounding periods. And the periodic rate cannot be quarterly. It must be yearly. So I'm going to leave it unknown for now. Our periodic rate per year is some unknown value per year. The number of compounding periods is just our 15 yearly payments. We notice these two do match, so that's good. But now we have to calculate this. So always, always, always check this and please <clears throat> be aware that for the general case, you cannot make the payments match the periodic rate. You must make the periodic rate match the payments. That's why we have this extra calculation. So this is where we do our little extra step. So we're going to need a periodic rate for a year. So what is it per year? So our periodic rate, remember, is the I2 is 1 plus I1, M1 over M2 minus 1, or you could have the C here. <clears throat> when I plug in the information, well, the given information I have is the 11% compounded quarterly. So that's my I1, 0 0.11 over 4. So my M1 is 4. What I want to know is the yearly rate, so my M2 will be one. I figure out what this is, I subtract it from, I subtract one from it, and I get my 
periodic rate per year is 0.11462 with all the decimals per year. And it's this value that I need to put into my formula. So don't forget your period needs to match, the periodic rate needs to match the payment period, not the reverse. So when I plug that in, there's my $8,000 payment. There's my periodic rate, 11462, with all the decimals. I had 15 yearly payments. Subtract from one, divide by the yearly periodic rate. And we get 285,619,01. So don't forget, for the general case, we need an extra step. What is the extra step? It's to calculate the equivalent desired, or in this particular case, annual periodic rate. It will not always be annual, so you'll have to always double check that. Let's continue on. So I just wanna show you uh, that the formula in the textbook matches what, what we did. So this was our extra step that we actually calculated. So the textbook has this formula. I2 is 1 plus I to the C minus 1. So our C is defined as the number of compoundings over the number of payments per year. And we get the exact same type of relationship as we did before. So we can see that these two are equivalent. For myself, I would prefer, um, <clears throat> I think it's better for you to use this method rather than some unknown to, some unknown I and some unknown C. This formula requires you to remember this. This one at least comes from the new is equal to old. Okay, so our new is the two, the old is the one. So old over new. So conceptual um, understanding of formulas is a, is a little bit better than just memorizing it. Okay, and you can see that we get the exact same calculations either way. So the basic concept, just recall, is that the one rate is doing the same thing as the other rate. So these two different values have to be equal. Let's try another example. We have a company making end of semi-annual deposits and it's being, we have a compounding rate of 13% compounding quarterly. So we have end, meaning ordinary. Then we have semi-annual and quarterly. They don't match, which means general. And always remember, general case requires an extra step, extra little calculation. <clears throat> now we want to know how much has accumulated. So again, we're going for your future value. So here's our first $35,000 at the end of the semi-annual period. Here's our last semi-annual payment at the end of 20 years. And where does the 40th come from? Well, 20 years times two payments per year, there's 40 semi-annual payments. So our future value is what? We're going to need a semi-annual periodic rate. We don't currently have it because we have a J4. And we can calculate the number of semi-annual payments, just the 20 times two or 40. And again, always take a second to make sure that you have the right units, the matching units. Let's do our extra step again. Here's our formula one more time. So my new rate, my semi-annual rate, will equal to the 1 plus the 0.13 over 4 to the 4 over 2. Take all of that and subtract 1. Notice the pattern here. The pattern here is that your I1 is your given periodic rate, so the 13 over 4. And then the M1 over ever M2, well, the 4 here matches the 4 there. And your desired periodic rate, the compoundings, are in the denominator. So that's another way to remember. And if you calculate that, again, you get the decimal 066, keeping all the decimals per semi-annual. So don't forget, they have to match. Plugging all this into our formula now, you should be able to calculate that that is going to accumulate after 20 years to $6.31492006 million. Let's try this one. This is our more complicating question. So there's a couple things going on here. There's two annuities. 
our first annuity. So here we have $3,000 end of each six month period. So 3,000 per semi-annual. We're doing it for eight years and our first rate is 9% compounded semi-annually. So J2 is 9%. Semi-annual payments, semi-annual compounding, end of period payments, ordinary simple annuity. <clears throat> we then put $600 per month for another eight years and compounding at 10% compounding monthly. Again, their end of month periods, so ordinary, monthly payments, monthly compounding, simple. And the total time passing here is we have 16 years in total. The first or annuity, we have to remember that once the first annuity is done at the eight year mark, it has to go forward again another year, eight years, to get to the 16 years. So let's take a look at each of these. Here's our first annuity. So there's our full zero to 16 years. Remember the annuity only happens for the first eight years for the first one. So there's the first annuity. 3,000 at the end of semi-annuals, semi-annual compounding, simple. So we can just do the 09 over two to get our periodic rate per semi-annual. Our number of semi-annual payments is 16 semi-annual payments. We can plug into our formula and we get the future value of that annuity is 6815810 and I will be keeping all the decimals here. Why I'm doing that is because we need the accumulated value at the end of 16 years. So for this annuity at the eight year mark, it's a lump sum. That's what it's equal to. And now that must go forward the final eight years and it goes forward just via compound interest. So again, <clears throat> we have our, peer, our nominal rate for the last eight years is a monthly rate, 10%. So we can calculate the periodic rate per month, double knot 833 with all the decimals, and our number of compounding periods, eight times 12 or 96 months. And we can bring that forward via compound interest. So notice how this lump sum is now being put here as our present value for the compound interest, one plus i to the n. And overall, we'd get 151, 186, 43. So a combination question that has an annuity growing into a lump sum, and then that lump sum growing again into another lump sum into the future. We could have done this in one single calculation. So here's the 3000 times the annuity formula. So the first part matches this exactly. And then we have the <clears throat> accumulating factor for the second eight years. And I deliberately used a different periodic rate here so that we could see that here the periodic rate is per month and we have monthly compoundings. So that's why we have the double knot 83 here and not the 045. We could have switched it around to um, semi-annual if we preferred, but there's no need to. Either way we do it, we get the 151. Let's take a look at the second annuity now. So remember the second annuity is starting at year eight. So again, $600 at the end of each month, we have monthly compounding, we're going to have an ordinary simple annuity. Because of that, we could just get our monthly periodic rate and calculate the number of months. So our second annuity will grow this way, 600, the payment, one plus i to the number of compounding periods minus one over i. And we'll get the future value of that second annuity is 87708.65. Putting everything together, well there's our first annuity. There it is going forward the second eight years. There's the 151. Here's our second annuity and there's its future value 87708. And now what we need to do is we need to add these two values. So in total the future value total of both annuities will overall equal 238 
89508. This is common. Think of it. You know, you might be able to do something, you know, and maybe um, I'm single, I've got a really good job, and I could put lots of money away, and I can do that for a certain time period, but oh, then what happens? Well, maybe I get married, maybe I have a child, maybe something happens that I'm not able to put as much money away, so I have to start putting less. Okay. So this is actually a very realistic example where you change the amounts of money that you're putting away. Let's take a look now at present value of ordinary simple and general annuities. So here we have <clears throat> Margaret wants to withdraw. So this time around she wants to get every um, year $1,000 and she wants to withdraw it at the end of every year. So there's the ordinary. She's going to do this for five years. So she's obviously going to need some money in the bank right now so that she can start taking out payments of $1,000 at the end of every year. Now her particular account where she has this money pays 10% compounded annually. So she's taking it out at the end, so ordinary. She's taking it out yearly. Compounding is yearly, so simple. Same type of thing in order to calculate the present value of this series of payments we'd have to bring each of them back to the today time period. And you can see here we've done that with the compound interest formula. Present value is future value times 1 plus i to the minus n. Okay. Again, you know, this is a relatively straightforward example where we only have to do five calculations. And we can see that Margaret would need 37.90 and 79 today in order to withdraw $1,000 and not go into negative balance type of thing. As before though, there is a quicker formula to do this. The present value is equal to that payment you're going to take. 1 minus the 1 plus i to the negative n over i. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. We want the cash value. So cash value means we're looking at present value. End means we have sometimes a series of payments. So end means ordinary. We have quarterly payments and quarterly compounding. So we have an ordinary simple annuity. <clears throat> Taking a look at the money movement line, we want all of these payments to come to today. So we have the end of quarter payments. Here's our last end of quarter payment. 16 comes from four years times four payments per year, so 16. And then our, there's our quarterly rate. Same skill as before. What's our periodic rate? Well, since we have a simple case, we can just do the 9% divided by four or double or 0 0.225 per quarter. Number of quarterly periods, four times four, 16 quarterly payments. Now we have all the pieces we need. We also have to, again, always, always, always check that these two units match. Plug in our values, use our calculator. So the cash value of these quarterly payments would be 86, 532, 10. What's the mortgage amount? Remember a mortgage amount is money we're receiving today. So that's a present value statement. End of month payments. End means we have some kind of ordinary annuity. Monthly payments, but compounding semi-annually. This time around we have an ordinary general annuity. So remember the ordinary general annuities require that extra equivalent interest step. Here's our timeline. There's our $1,100 payment at the end of each month. Our last payment is the 240th payment. 20 times 12 months per year would yield the 240. And there's our semi-annual nominal rate, 8.9%. As I said, the mortgage amount means we're looking for present value. So we will need our unknown periodic rate per month because our payments are per month. And we have the number of monthly payments is the 240. So because this is an unknown periodic rate, 
Okay, we could get the periodic semi-annual rate, but that wouldn't match. We'd have semi-annual and monthly. They don't match, so we can't do that. So we have to convert this semi-annual periodic rate into a monthly rate. So here's our extra step again. There's our formula. Here it is plugged in. So our monthly periodic rate will equal to 1 plus the 089, the semi-annual rate, divided by 2. The M1 is 2, so notice the 2's match. And then we want the monthly rate. There's the 12. Do that calculation. And you'll get 0072 with all the decimals per month. Now we have a monthly periodic rate and monthly payments. Now we can go ahead and use our formula. So don't forget the I has to match the payment period. You can't make the payment period match the I. Plugging everything in, here's all our values. Try your calculator and you get 124, 571, 08. Okay. So just like the future value, when we have the general case, we have this extra step that we must do. Here's another example that we have. Peter has paid, um, what has he paid here? $24,000 as a down payment towards a house. And he received a mortgage from the bank for the rest. This is very common for both for houses and for cars in a lot of cases. Um, in Canada, there is a requirement for putting 10% um, or different amounts depending on your credit rating. Uh, but a certain percentage of the value of your house that you're going to purchase in order to be able to buy it. He gets a mortgage for the rest and he winds up paying $1,380 at the end of every month for 30 years with an interest rate of 3.6 compounded monthly to settle the mortgage. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this out. So the payments made at the end of each payment period is monthly. The compounding is monthly. So what do we have? We have an ordinary simple annuity. Now here's the timeline for the payments. So our payments are at the end of each month. This is our 360th payment, 30 years times 12 months per year. Okay, and we want to bring that into the present. Okay, <clears throat> let's sort this out. Our payment is 1380. We have 360 monthly payments. Our periodic rate, because it's a simple case, we can just take the nominal rate of 036 divided by 12, and we get double not three per month. Plugging it into our present value formula, we have our 1380, the one minus, one plus the double not three to the minus 360, all over double not three. And we get the present value of our mortgage is 303,533.29. Now you might think that this is the purchase price of the house. No, this is the actual value of the mortgage. Remember, Peter, Peter had already put down a deposit on the house or a, a lump sum payment or a down payment if you prefer. So to get the purchase price of the house, we need an extra step. We need the down payment of 24000 plus the present value of the mortgage. So the actual purchase price of the house was 327,533.29, okay? Just watch out for this. Um, you know, if we had had no down payment, then this would have been sufficient, but hopefully you would realize that our monthly payments would have been a lot more than 1380. So the purchase price is the 327,533.29. Let's continue on. Now this is for anybody who might have the Texas BA2 plus calculator, the TVM, this would be the entry for it. And you'd get the exact same answer. Remember for us though, we're not required for TVM because the calculator is not a formal requirement of the course online. Second part of this question, what was the total amount paid over the 30 year period to settle the mortgage and how much of this was interest? So keep in mind for the mortgage, we got money from the bank. That's how much they gave us. We had to pay that off though. So we had to make these 1380 regular payments. 
So how much did we wind up paying in total? Well, we paid 1380 per month over 360 months. So we paid for, for $496,800. The interest that we paid, okay, that's the interest is going to equal for when we're dealing with present values, it's the total amount we paid minus the present value of the mortgage. So this is the total amount we paid, the 496800 This is the present value of the mortgage, not the purchase price of the house. Remember, it didn't cost us anything. We didn't have to pay interest on our down payment of $24,000. Okay, so that's not included here. Just the part that was mortgaged is where we had to pay interest. And we wound up paying 193, 266, and 71 in interest. So the total amount paid was the 496. And of that amount paid, 193, or almost just under half of it, was actually in interest. And this is one of the reasons why that we would like to pay off our mortgage is a common term you'll hear, or pay off our loan or pay off our, our lease. We want to do that so that we can reduce the amount of interest that we wind up paying off. Okay. Let's take a look at this example. Now this is a lease contract for a vehicle. The vehicle required a down payment of 2000. It required monthly payments of $350 for three years and a cash buyout of $15,000 at the end of the third year. And the lease rate is 9% compounded monthly. Now typically leases for vehicles are end of month payments. So we can consider this an ordinary annuity. We have monthly payments and we have comp compounding monthly. So we have an ordinary simple annuity for our lease. Now again, this is a complicated question. We have three things going on in this case. We have the $2,000 down payment. We have our annuity of the $350 per month payment for three years at J12, 9%. And we have the $15,000 $15, cash buyout at the end of the three year lease. Um, if you've ever had a family member or you yourself has purchased a vehicle, you'll always know that maybe you haven't purchased it outright. Maybe you're leasing it. So you've put some money down, like the down payment in this question, and then you pay a monthly rate for that lease. And maybe your lease was uh, going to be for, you know, like this example here for three years. And at the end of three years, you have to decide whether you're going to buy that car outright or give it back to the dealership. And when you um, buy it outright at the end of that period, it's going to have what they call a value or a cash buyout value because the vehicle is still worth some money after three years. Okay, so you'll have to pay that to the dealership. So for a money movement, well, the $2,000 not moving, that's just what we've given today. This, as I mentioned before, our monthly payments and monthly compounding is an ordinary simple annuity. We're going to have to bring that back to today because we want the cash value. So cash value, again, is more terminology saying what is the present value. And then our $15,000, well, that's what we have to pay at the end of three years. So if I want the cash value of this contract, I have to bring that $15,000 back to today. It's a lump sum. So it's coming back via compound interest. So let's go ahead and take a look at these three different parts. So there's our down payment. There's the timeline for it. It's not moving anywhere. So the present value, today's value of the 2000 is just 2000. Here's our monthly payments. So we have 350 at the end of every month. We have 36 payments in total. 3 times 12 is 36. So there's our periodic rate, 09 over 12, double knot 75 per month, 36 monthly payments. These two do indeed match. It's an ordinary simple annuity. There's our present value formula. There's our present value of the lease part, our monthly payments, 11 double knot 6 and 38 cents. Here's the cash buyout. Now remember the cash buyout is a lump sum of $15,000 owed at the end of three years. We have to bring this back to the today's value, present value, 
via compound interest. Now we have a monthly rate, so we can get the periodic rate per month, double knot seven five, and again, 36 monthly payments. So these also, remember in compound interest, the periodic rate and the number of compounding periods need to match. So bringing it back via compound interest, that's just our future value times one plus i to the minus n. We get the present value of that 15,000 is equal to 11,462.23. So our cash value for the lease, or the lease amount is another way to say that, is your down payment plus the present value of the lease payments plus the present value of the residual or cash buyout. So this $15,000, we had referred to it as a cash buyout. You can always also refer to that as a residual value. What is it still worth? When we add these three together, so we're adding the 2,000 plus the 11 double knot 638 plus the 11 462.23. Well, that particular vehicle, the cash value was 24 468.62. Okay. So again, a lot of different things going on here. You know, we're, we're looking at annuities. We're also still looking at compound interest and very realistic, very real life calculations. So this ends this set of notes for ordinary simple and ordinary general annuities. There are the online tutorials for you to go through with these. And we have our online assignment six for you to complete.